Financial accounting is focused because financial statements. There are three general purpose financial statements. One is a balance sheet, or sometimes referred to as a statement of financial position. The second one is referred to as an income statement, or sometimes a statement of operations, or statement of profits and losses. The third required general purpose financial statement is a statement of cash flows, which simply identifies the inflows, major inflows, and outflows of cash. These financial statements can be found in a company's annual report. Now, in these financial statements, there are two critical conditions that must exist for those financial statements to ultimately prove to be truly useful to investors and creditors. One critical element or condition that needs to exist is that they must be comparable. And secondly, they need to be credible. Let me describe what I mean here. In terms of comparability, what I'm talking about here is that comparability really refers to the need for companies to prepare and present their financial statements in the same basic way, utilizing the same basic formats for presentation and the same basic accounting methodologies as other companies. The reason for this is that investors and creditors are faced with choices. It's not just the decision as to whether or not they're going to provide a loan or capital contribution as an owner to your business, but they have other options. A banker might have a loan application not only from your business, but from a variety of different businesses. And so really, the investment uh, and, and credit-making decision is really typically a, a choice between investment or credit alternatives. And therefore, they're going to be looking at information not just from your business, but from other businesses also. And they want to make comparative analysis. But when they do that, they want to compare apples to apples. They like to get a set of financial statements or financial information in the form of statements that, are, that basically look about the same. I mean, they want to get a set of uh, some financial information, and both uh, both of those uh, documents have a balance sheet and an income statement, so that they can compare the balance sheet and the income statement. And they like that information to be formatted in some kind of a consistent way, so it's easy to compare. In addition to that, it's critical that the methods of accounting for a business's transactions be basically consistent or the same as the way other businesses account for their transactions. I mean, let me give you an example for just how important something like that might be. Let's assume that the banker is looking at some financial statements from two different companies, and he's trying to decide to whom he will make a loan for a million dollars. Both of the companies have requested a million dollars to capitalize the business or to allow it to grow more rapidly, and the banker's trying to decide, gee, which is a better loan, which is a safer loan, which one, which one, which of these two companies has the greater capacity to repay us, or in the event that there's some failure, they have more in terms of resources um, that we can access for repayment of our loan. And so that's the kind of thought process going on in the mind of a potential creditor. And as they get financial information from on both of these applications for the loan, uh, they're looking at the balance sheet. And the balance sheet will list the resources of the business, and he's looking at that, and he discovers that they're almost basically identical, except relative to certain land and buildings. Now, I'm going to make an assumption here that the banker is not aware of. Let's assume that, in fact, the land and the buildings on these two uh, different uh, companies, on their balance sheet, under resources here, that, in fact, the land and the buildings are basically identical. In fact, they, they were purchased about the same time by each of these businesses operating independently, but they paid basically the same amount. Let's assume that they paid, you know, uh, $500,000 for the land and the building. And basically, if you went up and look at the buildings and the land, they almost look identical. And they're in basically, you know, a common type of location. And they paid basically five years ago about the same price. And so theoretically, and, and let's assume that even today, you know, you'd expect that they'd be worth about the same amount. You would expect that, in fact, on the financial statements, that these, uh, this land and building should be reflected as one of the resources of each of the businesses, and that they ought to be valued about the same way. But let's assume for a moment that one of these businesses has actually gone out and gotten an appraisal. Maybe they even haven't even gotten an appraisal. They just in their gut have a feeling that, in fact, this, this land in the building is really worth much more. It's almost doubled in value in the last five years, or at least that's their belief, that's their opinion. And so they decide to reflect the building on their financial statement, provided to the banker, at a value of $900,000. The other business, however, is, uh, you know, they're not, uh, uh, the business may be worth 900000 in fact, but, but they've taken a more conservative approach in terms of valuing their assets. They're not really sure how much the asset is, and, and they believe that, in fact, they should reflect, uh, instead of maybe its current fair market value, they, they reflected the $500,000, the amount that they really originally paid five years ago. They don't have any current appraisal, and, and so they're taking a more conservative approach. Now, maybe you say, wow, that's stupid. Uh, you know, they ought to be as aggressive as they possibly can be in terms of valuing that business, uh, in terms of trying to impress this banker to make them alone. But they're just more conservative in character, and, and they put $500,000. It may have been an unwise decision, because now the banker looking at these financial statements, they assume that, in fact, these are you know, two very different businesses now. They're not exactly the same. This one has land and building that's clearly worth much more than this other company. Now, the fact of the matter is, is the banker should be entirely indifferent if, in fact, the businesses are virtually the same, even land and building. But the banker is relying on information that has been provided that's really a different technique of accounting for a particular kind of resource. They're not comparing apples to apples here. Yes, there's a building, but the way they've accounted for it is not apples to apples. They're not using the same methodology or approach. And so, in fact, the valuations are very different, and, and ultimately, the banker is relying on information that truly isn't comparable in making this decision. If, in fact, in fact, you are comparing businesses, but they haven't been prepared comparably, the information of those businesses, but that information is basically worthless. It may be worse that they might be deceptive so that you're actually making, not only not making a decision, but making really poor decisions based on information simply because it's not comparable. This requirement, this, this need, I should say, to have uh, the same financial statements that are pre prepared in basically the same kinds of formats to make it easy to compare, and they're done by the same kinds of accounting standards or techniques and methodologies. Uh, this need is, is, is significant. And so over time, we have developed what we refer to as generally accepted accounting principles, sometimes referred to simply as GAAP, G-A-A-P. These generally accepted accounting principles are the rules and standards of accounting that must be used by all businesses providing information to investors and creditors in order to create this required comparability that will make these financial statements really useful. Now, the second element of or condition that must exist in financial statements in order for them to be truly useful to investors and creditors, and again, let's, let's make sure we've got our focus here. Uh, what we're talking about is financial accounting, uh, the process of trying to create information that investors and creditors can use in making investment decisions intelligently. And we said that they need information, and, and in fact, that information it would be better if, in fact, it's governed by you know common rules of accounting to create comparability. But even if, in fact, they were using common rules, what if, in fact, the numbers, just the numbers that are in the financial statements just aren't right? See, these financial statements, in order for them to truly be useful to investors and creditors, not only need to be prepared in accordance with some generally accepted accounting principles to create comparability, but it also has to be accurate. Credibility refers to the need for the financial statements to provide information that is materially accurate and reliable. Now, who is it that really prepares the financial statements and determines the amounts that will appear on them? A company's management is responsible for its accounting system and the preparation of its financial statements to be distributed to the public. The problem is that management may have conflicts of interest in the accurate preparation of those financial statements. In some companies, members of management are also shareholders. That's not necessary in all cases. I mean, the, the president of, of Coca-Cola probably owns shares of Coca-Cola because, because they've been allowed the opportunity to buy those shares or even given stock options as some form of compensation. They kind of create the incentive for them to really have the best interest of the owners. Management that owns stock is as interested as the shareholders in terms of trying to increase the value of that stock so that they can all make money through the ultimate sale of that stock. But it's true that there are some you know, members of management that may not own any, any interest in the stock. But isn't there some kind of a conflict of interest, really, if management is responsible for managing the business and they also own stock? I mean, wouldn't
you know, in terms of our compensation, because people will be so impressed with our business, and then we'll sell the stock at a high price. And when everybody discovers that maybe the company wasn't doing so well, why won't we go on? I mean, you know, some people have actually gotten involved in businesses and seen the business not maybe performing as well as it should be, but wanted to actually falsify that information in a way to impress, you know, potential investors and, and maybe have them so that they could sell their stock and, and then move on their way. So management is responsible for preparing these financial statements, but they may have some conflicts of interest. Materially inaccurate financial statements are, at worst, at best, worthless. But at worst, they may actually deceive investors and severely, severely damage uh, the users of those financial statements. As a result, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the government regulatory body that's designed, uh, that's been established really to try and regulate capital markets and protect investors and creditors, they require that all financial statements of the publicly held companies over which they have jurisdiction be subject to outside independent audit for accuracy by an independent certified public accounting firm, a CPA firm. A CPA is someone who has uh, certain professional credentials and experience such that they can come into a business, take the financial statements that have been prepared by management, and perform some tests, some, some audit uh, of those financial statements to try and verify the material accuracy of that information and that, in fact, they have been prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. The CPA will issue an auditor's report that must accompany a company's financial statements and clearly state the material reliability of the information and its compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Let's kind of take a moment here and summarize what we're talking about and really the, the key players in this process. What we've been talking about are businesses seeking to access capital. I mean, you may be involved in this, in this picture in your own personal lives, but that you may be, you know, part of a business, starting your own business or part of a business that needs capital and is, is seeking that capital by borrowing it or from investors by effectively through issuing or providing ownership. In your business through the issues of stock. And you may be participating through companies that are trying to access capital in the market, or you may actually be uh, from the state involved in the standpoint of an investor thinking about maybe putting in investment capital into a business. And so what we've been talking about here is this process of companies, and we'll focus right now on publicly held businesses, these larger businesses that are going out to the general public, trying to access capital by borrowing it or, or issuing their stock or ownership. And they will approach these investors and creditors by giving them information. It is the annual report that contains the general purpose financial statements that investors and creditors can use to hopefully make intelligent decisions. This is what we're focusing on, this capital market. Now who are the players involved in this by way of you? Well, we said that the key regulator is the Securities yeah, and Exchange Commission. Yeah. They're a federal regulatory body, and that they are charged with the, the responsibility of regulating stock and bond transactions between these companies and the public investors and potential creditors. Uh, not only are they interested in the kind of information that is going to be provided to investors and creditors and have legislative responsibility over that process, but they're also interested in how these stocks and bonds are sold and people that are involved in that, in that sales process. So they are involved in the, in the regulation of the New York Stock Exchange and, and Bond Exchange and, and NASDAQ and the people and institutions that are involved in that process. Like the firms, Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch and, and provide regulation on how these businesses are involved in that process. Uh, regulating stock and the kind of information and representations that they can make and information that they can pass along. So that this market not only operates efficiently but fairly for all the players involved. Another federal agency that's kind of not really involved in this process, but they do affect publicly held companies. This is um, you know, my favorite regulatory body, the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, their responsibility is to collect income taxes from these companies. There are some other federal regulatory bodies that may be interested in publicly held companies and they want information from those publicly held companies. The Federal Trade Commission has some regulatory authority in the area of trade and, and federal communications commissions. And so there may be other regulatory bodies of the federal government that may need information. But what we're focusing on here is the stock and bond transactions with investors and creditors, the raising of capital for business. Now there are, as we suggested, some private organizations that are actually involved in this process or at least have some influence in that process. One is the AIC, the American Institute of Certified Public Accounts. Again, they were originally assigned the responsibility of determining the generally accepted accounting principles that would govern the kind of information to be provided to investors and creditors, but they no longer have that responsibility. However, the AICPA is still involved indirectly because they are involved in the licensing and certification of CPAs. Now, the CPAs are certified state by state. There's a state board of CPAs in a particular state that actually gives a certification for someone to act in the capacity of a CPA. And usually those state boards require that there be a certain amount of uh, college education, that, that uh, the candidate for the CPA certificate pass a, an exam, and that they have some kind of uh, apprenticeship, some practical experience before in fact they're authorized to perform audits of publicly held companies. The, the AICPA's involvement in this process of certification is, is it's the AICPA that, that uh, conducts and administers, provides the uh, CPA exam, by which all states use that exam in order to make some evaluation of competency uh, and knowledge in the profession. The AICPA is also involved uh, because they're the, the organization that establishes currently the rules of how to conduct an audit, and actually does some monitoring of uh, the professional conduct of, uh, of CPAs as they exercise their responsibility in the audit of public companies. The other private organization that does have some significant influence in this process of providing quality information to investors and creditors for their capital decisions is the FASB. Their responsibility is the creation of generally accepted accounting principles. And again, they do come under the influence of the SEC, but they are the ones now who are charged with determining GAAP. Now, let's do a quick summary of where we are today in this lesson. We started out by saying, you know, what is a business? And we're talking about different kinds of businesses, uh, manufacturing versus merchandising versus service businesses, or some combination of those three. And we talked about how any kind of, uh, any one of these businesses, in order for it truly to be successful, would need a really good idea. They probably need uh, some capital and some management skill. And we've mentioned that, in fact, maybe the most important thing, or at least the most difficult thing to access for a successful business is, in fact, capital. And we've emphasized that there are really only two ways that a business can access capital. You can either borrow it, or you can get it from the owners, or in other words, the investors. Now, investors and creditors need information in making their capital investment decisions. It's financial accounting that seeks to provide the financial statements for investor and creditor use in those decisions. Useful financial statements to investors and creditors must have the elements of comparability and credibility. Generally accepted accounting principles established by the FASB provide the key to comparable financial statements among differing companies. These generally accepted accounting principles are the rules that govern what information is going to be provided to investors and creditors, in what format it's going to be presented, and how the transactions of business are actually going to be accounted for and then reflected on those financial statements. It's also critical that those financial statements be materially accurate. This is accomplished hopefully through CPA, certified public accounting firm audits, are required by the SEC for publicly held companies that seek to ensure the financial statement credibility uh, of publicly held companies. कम से कम दस पीस का है घाय मुझसे